Hey, happy Friday. Today we're going to talk about Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. If you like serial killers, potentially haunted houses, morally gray characters, really complex emotional internal lives, this could definitely be up your alley. I say could because peeking around some reviews, it makes some choices at the end that could be a little divisive. Now the choices that the narrative makes, especially toward the end, are things that I'm really intrigued by but are also really really difficult to execute and takes a lot of skill. I think that it almost gets there. I do think it could have used just a little bit of an extra push. That being said, I think traditional horror fans, it's a little bit different vibe than they may be used to or maybe a little bit different turn than they were expecting but I think definitely fits within the interior world of this novel. So this book follows our main character and our main point of view though through the third person Vera as she goes home to care for her dying mother and she is going home to a home that she has not been to since she was kicked out as a teenager and we can tell from the outset that there is a lot of weight and history to both this place and her relationship with her mother and her relationship with this place. And the first, I would say, 100-ish pages, which is significant in a 340-ish page book, really set out to establish Vera in this place and what this house means to her because we are getting most of our narrative from within this house. And it is repeated again and again, the house that my father built and the weight of that because we know from the jacket much sooner than we know in the narrative that Vera's father was a serial killer. And so we are kind of re-entering this place with this knowledge if we've read the blurb. And even if we haven't read the blurb, we have this sense of some kind of foreboding in this space. And so the narrative goes back and forth between the present and the past as we kind of both explore and unwind the history of this place as Vera kind of settles back in, but also as we kind of tease out just what Vera's history is, what she knew, as we kind of always face this idea of what do people in these situations know or not know. And all of this is complicated by her really toxic relationship with her mother as her mother is dying, as she's sorting through all of these things that are kind of bringing back these memories and pushing the novel forward, even as the contemporary timeline is a little bit more quiet tension, especially within that first third of the book, we get that sense of unease and foreboding, as I mentioned. And then there's an additional conflict in that when Vera arrives, she encounters the artist in residence of sorts that her mother has invited into her home, into this place. And there's kind of a history of her inviting many many artists into this place and them mining this house and the history of this house and this family's stories for their art after Daphne her mother's money runs out. So she comes in contact with this artist that she is already primed to not like and then finds out that this artist is the son of of the man who wrote the book on her father, the kind of true crime writer that really propulsed her father's story into the larger world and the larger cultural consciousness. And as readers, we really don't get a huge sense of what the narrative on the outside is. We get one scene in town when Vera goes to the hardware store where it is very evident that she is not welcome in town. And that kind of sets off a string of questions or it set off a string of questions for me as a reader into what is going on. What does the town know? What is the story that had been told? Obviously, this is a very traumatic thing for a community to have experienced, but for someone to call out Vera in the hardware store after all that time, there is just, there are lingering questions there. So that is one of our biggest kind of outside eyes into this situation, because we're mostly seeing things through Vera's point of view and from the kind of claustrophobic, insular confines of this house. So even though we know that James's father really kind of altered the trajectory of Vera's life in many ways, I mean obviously the trajectory had already been majorly altered, we don't get a sense of what the outside knows about Vera and her family outside of the kind of obvious. So we get her first coming back, but we get kind of like little throwaway lines or flashbacks. There is maybe one line about how James's father chuckled when he was writing Vera and called her either a spitfire or a firecracker or something along those lines, but we don't get the full sense of what exactly was going on there, even as we get little blips 
of Vera's experience interacting with his father later in the narrative. But we also find out kind of how her life before coming back to the house was kind of transient. She was kind of living in this in-between because she would establish herself, maybe make friends or acquaintances, and then her identity would become known in some way and how that changed everyone's perception. But as readers, we didn't really get a full sense of what exactly they were responding to beyond her father's crimes as we learned about them, which is significant in and of itself. But I think on some level, I expected this book to be really critiquing and analyzing true crime and the idea of true crime from an outside lens and how the outside impacts those affected by it. And I don't think that that's what we got here. It's definitely a theme. And we see how James and his art almost becomes a violent act against Vera and how both him and his father have kind of taken the narrative and shaped it. And Vera hasn't been able to shape it herself or grapple with it herself. But this is also a book full of really complicated, flawed, morally gray characters. And it's a much more intricate kind of grappling. And rather, we're kind of focused in on Vera's emotional journey and her kind of emotional unraveling. And I think this emotional journey is kind of the crux of the thing and both where the work is the most delicate and where it doesn't always succeed because we see things kind of ramping up as the tension ramps up. So like I said, the narrative is told both through the contemporary timeline of Vera going through this house, but then we're also getting these cutaway flashbacks to the before, as we're kind of getting sprinkles of answers to questions for what really went down, what her father's crimes were, what the dynamic of the family was, how it shaped everything, and watching this girl who was completely in love, completely enamored of her father, and what the impact of his crimes were there as well. And the tension builds as we as readers kind of figure out some of what's going on. And then as that tension builds in terms of us kind of getting more of a sense of what the horrors of the past were, in the present, we get this kind of sense of tension, yes, but there's something not quite right. And there's something not quite right in that house from the minute Vera steps in, but it's kind of hard to tell at first what is just kind of a darkness from both the history of the place and Vera's relationship with her mother, but things slowly become more grotesque and more unknowable. And it becomes a question of whether the house is maybe haunted. And even James is kind of needling Vera, like, if you see something at night, let me know. But it's never clear whether he's doing that to kind of piss her off, or if he actually believes that there is maybe a spirit or a haunting involved in this house. And this is even with his art being kind of focused on the idea of haunting and the way tragedies linger. And I thought that that was really interesting too, because it kind of took a look at how you can exploit and mine these places within this context and maybe not totally believe in it yourself. How for him, it's a little bit of an intellectual exercise. He will take every opportunity to kind of talk about the concept behind his art. And he's always asking Vera for comment, but she doesn't want to speak to anyone. She doesn't want to give any more of her story away. There is a real anger there. And we can feel that as readers, even as we're getting answers to some of those questions. But the answers are a lot more complicated. And as this kind of darkness creeps into the house, we get a more complicated sense of Vera as a character as well. And we see a little bit of darkness in her as well as a hunger. And it kind of really focuses in on those feelings, which I think are super compelling. But I do think that the narrative is kind of playing its cards close to its chest in terms of some of the reveals that happen because there are multiple and some of them I definitely saw coming, but I don't think again that that's a bad thing. However, I think because we were playing the card so close to our chest in some of those instances, because of that, I think that some of Vera's character work could feel a little sudden or it felt like she changed as a character rather abruptly, especially because so much of her stuff was so internal and she was so buttoned up at the beginning that it felt a little bit of an abrupt switch. And so when we saw motivations that felt very drastic and different, it didn't feel as rooted to the why. And it was definitely there. I think I just would have liked to see a little bit more subtle gradient to get us there. Because when you're working in these extremes, whether it be the character work or some of the plot turns, if they don't feel as rooted or grounded or 
you know, connected to the character we've been getting to know, it feels a little bit more absurd and it throws the reader out of it. And I think that's where some readers are having trouble with some of the ending bits. However, I can see it happening as well. I see the little moments that Gailey sprinkles in, whether it's the carving into the wall of the house, these little details that really kind of show us as readers that things aren't quite right. And we get little peeks of that in Vera as a character as well. And the prose and the pacing are so propulsive. I was constantly engaged and pushing, even amidst the bits that were a little bit more reflective and internal. And so I think it really works together really seamlessly in a lot of ways. I think there's just that final hump that is a little hard to overcome. And it's going to be hard to deal with no matter what, because it's a really delicate plot turn that teeters just on the edge of the absurd. But for me, it really manifests a really interesting look at both what it means to be good, but also what it means to have a place and to have a place that has shaped you and grown you and turned you into who you are, but to also have had that place impacted by such horrors and whether that can be felt by a place and how that impacts both the place and the person that grew up in that environment and also the different kinds of horror. You have here a man who is evil in a lot of ways and does horrible, awful things, but is also the parent that unequivocally loves Vera. And we see a really tense, abusive relationship with her mother in a lot of ways. And so this book doesn't offer any easy answers. And I think that that's a really interesting take too, because especially in true crime, which is not something I'm super enmeshed in because of a lot of reasons. I'm not naive to it either. It can be easy to boil stories down to good and evil. And oftentimes that's the case. But this book is complicating that a little bit. At the same time, I don't think even the true crime element of it is as prominent as I went in expecting. Rather, it's one angle of horror in this and one piece that's kind of shaping Vera as a character. Because ultimately, Vera is an interesting, tough, flawed window into this world where nobody is totally innocent. And we do see a lot of hunger, as it's described in the book, or desire or want from these characters and how that can often hurt the people around them. And here, as Vera kind of minds those feelings, both the hunger and the loneliness and the pain, as she's doing this, we see her surroundings and even her mother decaying at an exponential rate. And so in many ways, the physical world here is a reflection and a manifestation of the emotional world, which also really complicates this idea of what is going on potentially at night here. We get flashbacks to Vera talking about the thing under her bed and her father comforting her about what's going on under her bed, that there's no monster down there. And we come to find out that that may even be more complicated. And I'm sure you can guess where that's going. But in the contemporary timeline, she is waking up with the blankets gone or having this sense that there's something in the room with her and she is going back to this idea of something being under the bed. And is that just a projection based on what we're getting a sense of in the flashbacks? Or is there something more sinister going on? And can the horrors that have happened in this house have manifested more as we often kind of grapple with when we look at places where atrocities have happened and later think of them as haunted because it's hard to think of a place as being unaffected by a tragedy of that nature. And so here we have a place that we only really see Vera speaking of with love. She talks again and again about this being the house that her father built, as I said, and she speaks lovingly of the quirks of this house that most anyone else would be like, what? Like how the bathroom has two doors, but neither of them lock? Like, okay. I'm realizing now that my bathroom might also have two doors that don't lock, but I live in a converted apartment in Chicago and there's not much rhyme or reason to most things. So yeah, this book kind of plays with a lot of different elements of horror to kind of kickstart spooky season. And while it deals with kind of the real horrors of a serial killer and these kind of fantastical horrors of is there something else going on? Is this place haunted? At its heart too, it's really looking and forwarding the kind of psychological horrors of people and what people are capable of 
whether they have ill intentions or not, and the different kind of degrees of harm we can do, and then looking at how that manifests and how that story gets told, even as, again, we're not really seeing the story from the outside. But Gailey gives us just enough breadcrumbs to keep us moving down the path and really ups the tension as we keep moving deeper and deeper into the horrors of this house and the horrors of the events that happened in and around the house. So like I said, I think especially the ending of this book is going to be a little divisive. So if you have read this, I would be very interested to hear your thoughts. I've clearly tried to talk around big spoilers related to some of the twists and turns of the book. Personally with that twist, I felt like it almost came a little too abruptly. I liked the tension that we'd set up right before that climax. And the answers made me do a little bit of a double take and I was like, oh, that's where we're going. And I don't know that it completely gelled with everything else that had been established so far, but I do think it was trying to say something very particular. Can I articulate exactly what I think it was trying to say in this moment? No, but there were definite plays on the theme of home and belonging and what that means wrapped up in that. It was just like I said, so extreme a turn that it gave a little bit of whiplash. And I struggle with this at the end of a lot of books like this because it's really hard to execute that ending when you have been establishing tension for so long because in many ways, any release of that tension is going to feel like a letdown because you have so much built up into the feeling of that and the expectation of that. So anyway, yes, I'm very interested to hear what other people think about that twist. Because like I said, I'm interested in the thematic explorations there, not so sure 100% about the execution, but I also don't think the execution was awful by any means. And if after this you're looking for books that feel kind of in the same emotional universe in some ways, Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia, is always going to be one I recommend. It's not a perfect fit, but it also fits mood-wise in my brain, so we're going to make it work. And then A Treason of Thorns by Laura Weymouth, which is a young adult title. And maybe don't look up the synopsis of that before reading this book if you don't want any spoilers. But those are my brief or not thoughts on this one. Thanks for hanging out and listening to them. Leave yours below if you've read this, if you have thoughts. Read something good, like and subscribe if you feel like it, and yeah.